As the boy jolted himself from his sleep, he tried to catch his breath. He felt a slight burning sensation running across his chest. What was that? He said to himself, trying to remember the rest of the dream. All he could remember was an image of a tall citadel standing firmly at the center of a city. He felt as though he was drowning in that moment of dreaming, and even now that feeling still lingers on. Looking around the place, he saw nothing that resembled his neighborhood, everything from the lush red leaves and tall trees. Trying to remember the reason as to why he ended up in such a place, Fumio could only remember the moments before the accident. His friends all together playing football by Alan's house. It was a very normal Saturday morning. It should have been a very normal Saturday morning, but this was far from normal. Enjoying their summer break, they shared dreams and plans for the future ahead of them. But of course, as young and as naive as they are, they displayed no desire for reasonable and attainable futures. They only wanted one thing, to be together forever. It was a childish dream, but it was a dream that they shared. Confused and lost, he decided to muster the courage to look around. He stood as tall as he could, raising himself up onto the tips of his feet, hoping to find someone or something in that place. Fumio was surrounded by trees with grey barks and leaves as red as fire. The ground beneath him was made up of fallen leaves that had small spots of grey and dark reds in them. The trees, tall and robust, stretching far into the sky, obscuring the morning sun. The leaves allowed some light to pass through, which gave it a crimson glow. The vine in the roots, further than the eyes could see, colliding and combining as they ran across the forest. Following that trail of vines, he saw the roots raise ever so slightly from the ground. The debris and random rocks formed what seemed like steps that made up a path. Though the boy was scared, he was intrigued and thought to himself that it was better to walk this path than stand where he is now. It was much better than wandering aimlessly. Then again, he didn't know where he was going, where he was, and if there was anything waiting for him out there. As he followed the path that led deeper and deeper into the forest, the trees grew taller with every step, obscuring the light more and more. The path he was on seemed to never end. They stopped getting higher and maintained a height, a steady height throughout the entire remainder of the journey. He encountered not a singular creature of any kind, not man nor animal. All he saw were the beautiful crimson leaves and the greyish barks of the trees that looked as if they were stripped of colour to give more attention to the leaves. After much time has passed, the boy has made it into an open space, where the trees parted away for the sun to be in view again. At the centre, bathed in the spotlight, was a substantially large tree. The bark itself was wider and taller than that of a building. The leaves were vibrant green with a brown bark. Surrounding said tree were seven large black pillars with chains that connected each of the pillars together in a circular formation. The pillars looked like they were made of a reflective material. He admired its sheer size, its luscious green, and wondered, why aren't there any birds on the branches? The boy felt sad, knowing that no birds would ever enjoy this tree. He further commented that if he was a bird himself, he would find joy climbing and flying through this tree. From behind him, the sound of leaves and twigs can be heard. He turned his head back, and in view he saw someone. Beautiful, isn't it? said a voice. It was a tall young man dressed in a black and white robe. He wore a golden circular spectacle and a bittersweet smile accompanied his face. His hair was neatly tucked back with not a singular strand out of place. The heavens needed it no more and offered it up as a gift to the underworld as a reminder of humanity's rebellion. But such beauty could not be wasted in the realm of the sinful, and so they handed it over to us to care for it, said the man. Fumio kept looking at the man while the man kept looking at the tree. 
the man extended his hand over to touch the tree. You used to be so high up amongst the favoured creatures, but look at how low you've fallen. Yet in this forest you remain as beautiful as the day I met you. Such a shame only those who can die can see you. The boy walked forward to touch the tree. He expected a rough texture that would scar his hand, but instead it felt soft and almost caring to the touch. He couldn't describe it. The tree made him associate the texture with memories instead of a feeling. That's how it allured the first of man. It made them feel. A sensation not present at the time of birth. How would someone who was born with angels underneath their feet know what a feeling is? Perhaps that void in one's knowledge was enough for man to cross the word. The man turned to Fumio. He kept his hands behind his back as he smiled at the boy. Welcome to Purgatory. I congratulate you on your awakening. You've been asleep for hundreds of years, and that all felt to you as nothing but an abrupt awakening, the man said. Purgatory, the boy replied in confusion. Apologies, it seems like such a word was not available to you at the time of your death. Give me a moment, let's see. Ah, here we are. Kiritsugu Fumio, born November 21st, 2000, died January 14th, 2013, making you officially 13 years old. And a half, said Fumio. The man gently chuckled at the boy. He then continued, Cause of death, high-speed impact with a truck driven by John Miller, age 45. You were dead upon arrival. Your organs failed by the time you were admitted. John Miller was caught speeding in a residential area while driving under the influence. He was arrested shortly after. But I'm still alive, right? I am talking to you and moving closer to you, Fumio said as he stepped forward. What you are is a special case. You weren't meant to be here, at least not for this long. He then explains, when people die, they are judged based off of their actions towards their friends, peers, and family. Many live their lives not knowing what they did, believing they deserve the spoils of heaven because they never killed someone. It was never enough being a good law-abiding citizen, and being a criminal does not guarantee passage to hell. The calculations that led to the final judgment are far more complicated than that. The intention, the person involved, the status, and so much more are accounted for in the eyes of the scale. It rules over the lives of humanity with no remorse and no favourites. One could argue that evil can be viewed as heroism by the other party involved, for every case is just until lost. Such worries are unfounded, for in the scale, no matter how the goal is, or how just that goal might be, if the means to such ends are unlawful, then you are punishable in the eyes of the scale. In the same vein, there are also those who believe that the moral compass they own is far more superior, that they are not bound by their earthly actions, so long as they commit it in the name of a larger entity to themselves. Because arrogance has as much of a price as ignorance, they're just paid differently. When your time of judgment came, you baffled the High Council. Never in their millions of years have they encountered a case such as yours. Your age and deeds sit right in the middle of the scale. You are neither good nor bad. You are neither worthy of heaven nor deserving of hell. You balanced the scale, he said. What will happen to me? The boy said. That I don't know of as of yet. The Grim Reaper went up for business on the first floor. He said he will personally see to your case. He'll inform you personally of what will become of you soon. Is the Grim Reaper scary? The boy said. The man placed his hand on the boy's head and ruffled his hair gently to lighten the atmosphere. Hardly. The Grim Reaper is not as terrifying as you've all made him out to be. In his line of work, he might seem like someone to be feared. After all, he is the final person you see right before you die. His blade is the final echo that reverberates through the empty halls of the assembly. I blame no one for being scared of him, said the man. The boy looked up from the man's hand and said, But who are you, sir? Fumio said. My name is Hypnos. I take care of newly awakened souls and guide them to their newly appointed homes. 
may it be good or bad, you can think of me as a bookkeeper of some sorts, as most documents go through me first, said the man. When a person dies, their soul is, for lack of a better word, placed on hold. Every day the scale judges thousands of people, meticulously and mathematically, sorting them out as either evildoers or good souls. While the dead wait, their souls are placed under a never-ending and unbreakable slumber, where they relive their life once more. They subconsciously gauge their actions in this time period as well, which, you know, becomes another variable for the scale. Those who are under this spell sleep for hundreds and even thousands of years only to be awakened on their trial. The boy looks down and looked as if he was about to tear up. I hope my mum isn't mad at me, said the boy. Death is the purest form of action. Unattained by discrimination and human malice, devoid of perception yet so full of sympathy. The conclusion to one's suffering, the solution to one's loss of meaning. One might find peace in death, while others may find regret in it. Some take their judgment in peace, while others take it with a heavy grain of anger. Yet whether you like it or not, in this place, your desires and intentions will be revealed to you in full. The sick and the twisted, the purest and adulterated, the cruel and the kind. It's inhumane, yes, but no man-made laws govern them anymore, because here, it is only intention that gives them value to the scale. From the door, a tall man dressed in ceremonial black suits appeared. His posture commanded respect and attention from the moment he walked in. He looked around the forest and walked towards them. On his right hand, gripped tightly, he held the body of a man that seemed to be unconscious. The body was dragged from its collar with its shoes dragging against the rooted floor. The man threw the body towards the boy with a powerful swing, sending the body rolling underneath the boy's feet. You're back, sir. How did your business go? said Hypnos. The tall man looked at Hypnos with squinted eyes and said, The council gave me an earful about the boy, claiming that it is against the rules to keep a soul in purgatory, not knowing that the whole purpose of this place is to collect souls and grant them salvation or damnation, he said. Have they decided on his destination? Hypnos asked. He is to stay here until further notice, he pointed at the body. By stay here, you surely don't mean inside of that boy, Hypnos inquired. I got permission from the bishops. There are no signs of life in this body anymore. It's just an empty shell of a man that once was and never will, said the tall man as he looked at the body with disgust. Fumio looked at the body and examined it carefully. The body had long blue hair and pale skin. It was dressed in a green bomber jacket and a black t-shirt underneath. He looked older than Fumio, but not by much. Has the mental link been severed between the body and the boy? Said the tall man. Yes, sir. His mind is ready to reattach onto a new link, said Hypnos. Get in the body then, kid, said the tall man. The boy and the tall man's eyes met. His eyes were empty of any light or any sign of anything. But it was the kind of empty that was hollow. It felt like his eyes were draining everything and everyone around him. Are you the Grim Reaper? asked Fumio. Yes, now be a good boy and get into the body, said the Grim Reaper. But I don't know how, said Fumio. He's newly awakened, sir. He doesn't even know what he is, said Hypnos. The Grim Reaper looked over to Hypnos and asked him, Can I leave this matter of possession to you, Hypnos? I have more headache-inducing matter to deal with. Once you successfully have gotten him into the body, brand him with this seal, said the tall man. He pulled out a long wrinkled paper. On the paper was a blue ink drawing of a circle with a candle in the middle of it. This is a familiar seal, sir, said Hypnos with a surprised tone. A tall man turned over to him and said, From now on, you will be my familiar. You will aid me in extractions and guidance of souls to the underworld. You will be judged for your actions here in purgatory as if you were on earth. Whether you will end up in heaven or hell is none of my business. It's a fate that you have made for yourself. A fate that you will live 
according to how it was made for you.